Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from Beringer Ingelheim. Hello, my name is Bruce Strober. I'm a clinical professor of dermatology at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. I also practice at Central Connecticut Dermatology in Cromwell, Connecticut. Welcome to this program entitled Countdown to Knowledge of Novel Therapies for Generalized Pustular Psoriasis Flares, also called GPP flares. Joining me today is Jonathan Barker, who is a professor of medical dermatology at St. John's Institute of Dermatology in London. Welcome. Thank you, Bruce. So this is a quick fire program, Jonathan, and we'll just have a minute, sometimes 90 seconds to cover each question. I'll be firing a lot of different questions at you and we'll cover several topics. For example, key characteristics of GPP, the natural course of the disease, off-label therapies currently used to control GPP and rationale for newer treatments and the latest data supporting those newest treatments. So let's start. Jonathan, as a first question to you, and I'm only going to give you 60 seconds. After that, I ring a gong. What are the key signs and symptoms of GPP? Well, thanks, Bruce. Um, I think the first thing to say about GPP is that it's um, a rare uh, neutrophilic skin disease. Um, and as such, I think we need to regard it as an auto-inflammatory uh, uh, condition. Um, the cardinal feature of GPP is sterile pustules. Often these are pinpoint in size, um, but they can coalesce into uh, large lakes of pus. Um, they nearly always occur on tender, bright red areas of inflamed skin, um, and they can in fact um, um, affect very large areas um, of the body. Uh, quite typically, flexural areas um, are the, the predominant sites um, involved. Um, and crucially, quite often the patients feel very sick with this condition. And it can manifest with and without psoriasis vulgaris, ch chronic plaque psoriasis, which is usually regarded as an autoimmune condition. And I think that tells you that they're slightly different. So Jonathan, who gets GPP? Um, can you comment on the demographics? Uh, yeah, I, well, thanks, Bruce. Yes, I mean, I think it's, uh, it, it, the, the key thing to say is that it does appear that the demographics of GPP are, are again, very different from psoriasis vulgaris. Uh, there is a tendency for it to occur uh, again in young middle aged around about 40, but the, there's a huge variation in age. It can occur in young ch children um, and also in the elderly. And incidentally, if it affects the elderly, often the prognosis is worse because of the systemic inflammation that the patients receive. Um, there is a predominance in women, uh, usually around about 65, 35, 60, 40, something like that. And also interestingly, um, there is definitely racial variation, and it does appear uh, to be more common in Asian people, um, and hence, hence the condition is much, seems to be much more common in the Far East um, uh, than, than it is, for example, in, I think, the US and definitely in Europe. Well done, Jonathan. You broke the world record. You did it in under 60 seconds. So, Jonathan, in 30 seconds, can you tell me a little bit about the disease course of GPP? Yeah, thanks, Bruce. Um, th this is a, a, a very challenging uh, uh, condition to discuss, of course, because it's so highly variable. Uh, most of the time, it's um, an intermittent um, episodic disease characterized by waves of pustulation and erythema. Um, but sometimes patients have a, a much more chronic uh, nature to their uh, GPP. So there's a huge spectrum in that, a, a, a huge spectrum of activity of the disease. So. Um, I think, Bruce, I've, I've discussed the, the demographics um, and the clinical features um, of the disease. 
Um, and um, so I, I think it's an important question for you. And because it's important, I'm going to give you 90 seconds for this one. Um, why is it so important to effectively treat uh, GPP? Well, basically, GPP makes people very sick, as you alluded to earlier. So in, in that regard, you have to normalize them and make them functional. But more importantly, because GPP can be so severe in many people, it can lead to hospitalization and complications and subsequently even death. Um, in fact, the severity can be so great that uh, up to 30% or more of the body can be involved in at least a third of the patients and many flares leading to that, le that level of severity. And then hospitalizations um, are not often brief. They on average can be 10 days or longer. And during hospitalization, there can be complications. Perhaps one in five, one in six people have a complication that ultimately could lead to death. The most common causes of death in people with GPP would be sepsis, uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and cardiac failure. Um, so um, there's multiple levels that speak to the importance of uh, rapid intervention and effective intervention to prevent hospitalization, uh, morbidity, and mortality. Bruce, you answered that in less than 90 seconds, and you weren't even speaking quickly. So back at you, Jonathan, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna remind you that um, the world record for answering this question was 91 seconds. Let's see if you can do it in 90. Uh, what are the off-label therapies currently used to manage GPP to prevent uh, uh, morbidity and mortality? And what are the limitations associated with these therapies? Oh, thanks, Bruce. Well, I, I, I think that's a key issue with GPP is that there, there are basically no medicines that have been primarily uh, developed to treat GPP. And, and in fact, the treatments that we do use uh, are all borrowed from um, psoriasis uh, vulgaris. So uh, people use retinoids, they use cyclosporin, they use methotrexate, um, and indeed sometimes in acute episodes, uh, systemic corticosteroids um, are used. Um, and quite clearly, all of these medicines have uh, their problems. And uh, cast your mind back, we mentioned that, the, that this is a condition more common in females, um, and maybe in females of childbearing age, which of course, of course makes use, the use of retinoids and methotrexate very challenging. Um, and then the other drugs like cyclosporin and, and systemic corticosteroids quite clearly can only be used in the very short term um, and for conditions that, that can um, last for many, many years, uh, they're, they're, they're not appropriate. Um, and so the, the standard systemics are, are really quite challenging uh, in, 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 uh, in when using them in GPP. And then there are the biologics. And of course, we buy, the biologics we sometimes use are, all, are also bo uh, borrowed from psoriasis vulgaris. But I think it's important to state that other than in Japan, they are un, um, unlicensed. Um, and it's my personal experience that they're no, not as effective as they are in plaque psoriasis. So I hope that answers your, your question, Bruce. Um, and the, the fact that we need new treatments uh, for GPP. Um, and so um, I would like to ask you about a little bit about pathogenesis of GPP um, and why it's so important to, to develop new therapies. Well, as you mentioned, the biologics over the past two decades have allowed us to selectively and safely, effectively treat people with, with run-of-the-mill psoriasis vulgaris. And that was basically because we found targets such as IL-17 and IL-23 uh, that when inhibited um, accurately and, 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 and effectively control psoriasis. Now the same rationale uh, for GPP should be at work where we identify targets that are, are major players in the pathophysiology. And it's clear now through a lot of different analyses in particular uh, people with naturally occurring mutations in the IL-36 pathway, that IL-36 and its receptor and the subsequent uh, messenger molecules that affect transcription of various inflammatory genes are playing a large role in GPP. So um, interruption of IL-36 and some of its related pathway members uh, should allow us to specifically and safely uh, treat generalized postural psoriasis 
in a way that we are grown accustomed to with treating regular psoriasis with our targeted therapies for IL-17, IL-23, and TNF. Jonathan, we just talked about targets that might effectively allow us to treat GPP, one of which is the IL-36 receptor. And we have a drug, a biologic, spizolumab, that specifically targets IL-36 receptor. Could you in 90 seconds comment on the study design and demographics of FSCL1 and allow us to understand better how data were generated for this particular antibody? Well, thanks, Bruce. Um, and um, indeed, there was a, an important phase two study uh, published later um, in, in 2021 um, concerning um, spazolimab um, in GPP. Um, bearing in mind this is a rare disease, it was a relatively small study. Uh, 53 patients were enrolled, uh, 35 uh, patients received uh, 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 spazolimab, um, and 18 received placebo. Um, what I found interesting about this study was the very high uh, uh, primary outcome um, um, variable, um, namely no pustules um, at all um, one week after the intravenous injection um, um, of the drug. Um, the patients who were enrolled um, into the study had um, significant GPP. Um, there was about 60, 40 females to males. Um, the study was done um, globally um, and as discussed before, uh, given the, the fact that the disease is quite common in the Far East, um, about 50% of the patients were recruited um, in the, the Far East. And on the basis of that, uh, this is a single uh, intravenous injection. Um, and as I said, primary outcome measures um, at week one, but studies were ongoing and there was an open label extension so that, that they were able to collect longer term data um, on the patients as well. Perfect, Jonathan, less than 90 seconds. Now in 60 seconds, tell me about what they found as the efficacy of spazolimab in this particular study. Well, that's the really exciting thing, Bruce, um, about this work is that, that despite this really high hurdle um, at week one, 54% of the patients receiving spazolimab had no pustules one week um, after a, a, an IV um, um, infusion, which I, I think is uh, really uh, quite incredible. Um, indeed, um, it, when data mining, it was found that some of the patients were, were improving 24, within 24 hours uh, of, of the, the IV um, injection. Um, and also very gratifying is that very recently, some of the more longer term data has been released um, and out at 12 weeks um, after um, intravenous injection, um, uh, as published at the um, AAD in the post form recently, 84% um, of patients were clear um, at, at 12 weeks, which I think is really very, very exciting. Very impressive. Now, in another 60 seconds, I'd like you to tell me, well, what were the safety aspects of this study? Yeah, Bruce, well, I mean, uh, it's very important that we, we, we focus on efficacy, but we need to understand the, the, the safety of these drugs. Um, and bear in mind that these, this is a relatively small study, um, so, so you know, more, more work's required. But generally, um, the, the, the safety uh, signals were really very good in this. There were, there, there were some um, infectious um, episodes, uh, but again, nothing um, unusual or, or worrying appeared to occur. Um, one of the standout um, uh, safety events in, in the study was drug, two patients had drug reactions. Um, and um, while I don't think that these were terribly severe from what I understand from reading the papers and, and they, they resolved, uh, we need to know in the fullness of time what these drug reactions are um, and, and whether this is something that we, we need to be concerned about. But I, I think so far the safety profile is, is, is really very good. So Bruce, I've been talking about spazolimab, um, but there are two drugs in development uh, for GPP and the second one is imsodilimab. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a bit about this drug and start, if you don't mind, in 60 seconds um, about the study design and demographics. Thanks, Jonathan. Imsodolimab is also an anti-IL-36 receptor monoclonal antibody, uh, so similar to spazolimab, but studied a little bit differently. It'll, it'll be evaluated in a, some of an open-label approach. Eight patients given initially an IV formulation and then followed on Q4 weeks with a sub-Q formulation. 
The patients they enrolled in this study uh, were on average about 51 years of age. Half of them were women, mostly white, overweight, and they were measured by what's called the MJDA score, which ranges from one to 17. Um, but the average or the mean score in this study was about nine. And interestingly, uh, the mean area of involvement of erythema in these patients was about 25%. Bruce, you did a great job. I asked you to do it in 60 seconds and you did it in less. Well done. Now let's go on to, to hear whether there's some exciting efficacy data or not. And again, you've got another 60 seconds for this. The efficacy was measured a little bit differently than what was done for spazolamab in that they used what's called a CGI responder status. In a nutshell, it's just whether the patient improved or not. They could be minimally much or very improved or they could have um, no change or worsening. And 75% um, uh, of the patients, six out of the eight patients enrolled in this study showed some degree of improvement, um, which basically speaks to a very high efficacy of the drug. Um, if you look at signs and symptoms, um, basically uh, the baseline level of signs and symptoms was reduced by 60% very rapidly in the course of a month's therapy and held out over the course of 12 weeks. And there was a huge reduction in the area of erythema and pustulation. Uh, in fact, uh, almost a complete resolution of erythema and pustulation um, was the mean improvement in all these patients. And safety, Bruce, what about the safety? Well, I always say, you know, it's hard to look at safety in an eight person study, that's for sure. So um, we'll just say that it looked pretty well tolerated. There was um, a couple SAEs. One was a case of nosocomial infection and one was uh, a COVID infection. So uh, probably neither was related to drug. There was some treatment uh, emergent adverse events in three out of eight of the patients. A nausea, nosocomial infection, oropharyngeal pain. I wouldn't put too much on these data because of the small uh, sample size and the short-term follow-up. But uh, that said, it's a good start. It'll be important to see in larger phase three how well the, the drug performs, not only from efficacy, but also safety. You've kind of um, alluded to the, the next question I was going to ask you in, in that, that, that quite clearly in drug development, we need more studies to understand efficacy, tolerability and safety. Um, are there more studies to come for both of these drugs? Yeah, you know, I think I could uh, do this in 30 seconds. Uh, it, there's, there's going to be some expanded access studies in Asia, for example, in China and Japan. Uh, spazolamab will be administered to people who have no other hope. In other words, they have no other treatment options and they're flaring. And then uh, interestingly, spazolamab will also be evaluated as a sub-Q formulation um, in a very large study in phase two that's currently enrolling. So um, I think, uh, we're going to broaden the use of spazolamab uh, and, and see a different formulation of it. So, Bruce, that's um, spazolamab. What about um, imcidilumab? Well, imcidilumab, interesting, will be in a phase three study called Gemini 1. And this is going to be, from my point of view, the first placebo controlled evaluation of the drug, where they'll be giving a, a couple different doses 750 and 300 milligrams and a placebo um, to people. Uh, with GPP, kind of akin to what we saw for the spazolamab study. So a more rigorous evaluation, more long-term evaluation, and a larger study um, to, to broaden our understanding of this drug. Thank you. So in 90 seconds, Jonathan, uh, kind of as a summary, what are the implications of these recent advances for clinical practice in the management of patients with GPP? Well, thanks for that question, Bruce. And, and um... I'm sort of delighted to have a go at answering this question because I, I, I think we are on the cusp of very exciting times in the management of GPP. Um, and I think this is really a, a, a good example of how science has led to therapeutic improvement. Um, and in, in particular, I think the discovery that IL-36 is central to the pathogenesis um, of uh, GPP um, has led to a new era in the fight against this disease, which as you indicated earlier on, um, is associated with high morbidity and indeed high uh, mortality. Most importantly, it's allowed for the development of new therapeutic agents uh, that directly target the primary disease mechanisms. And we've heard about two of them um, in, uh, in, in this discussion uh, today. 
uh, I think the clinical trials of these drugs is really uh, very exciting. And I think uh, the two drugs we've heard about hold, hold uh, much promise. Um, it's quite clear that further studies need to be done in terms of the drug development. Um, we need to potentially understand how to use these medicines, what's the best way of administering them. Um, um, but I think that our patients with GPP should be very optimistic that there are going to be some better and more specific treatments available to them, hopefully in the very near future. Well, Jonathan, that's been an excellent summary, and uh, I, I echo your sentiments. In all honesty, this is a, a new frontier for us, obviously a rare disease in GPP, but one that has great importance for the people who are affected by it. Um, and I really want to thank you for, all, for participating in this activity. For all of you listening, please continue on uh, to answer the questions that follow. Um, it's been a great pleasure speaking with you today and I hope you've learned much about this exciting topic. Mm -hmm.